Welcome to Metal Locker 77. And we have a special guest today. Kate Fagan is here. I'm Howard Bryant. Amin Al Hassan is not here. But we got a squad today. We got Bamani Jones. I think you know who he is. HBO's Game Theory, ESPN, Everywhere Man. You see him on <laughs> what, where, where we got you now on the um on the on, on the quick hits. Still doing some MSNBC, CNN. Where yeah, else do yeah. I, I do a little CNN here. Um, they they seem to. I, I feel like they're waiting for when I'm gonna ask for some money for this. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like like it's 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 getting. You haven't yet. <laughs> yeah, it's getting just a little too regular, right? Like it goes from being flattering to like, hey. Can, can we stop you right there for a second, Bo, and just throw this out for all you, all the all, all you youngsters out there who are coming up in the business, and there's this this battle between exposure and are you exploiting me? Like, when do you <laughs> ask for some money? When do you say, you know what? Every time there's a story, y'all call me, and I'm doing this for free, and in the pandemic age. You know, asking me to do podcasts and whatnot, you're asking for a lot of time. When do you say pony up? Yeah, that's a good question. Because, like, I parlayed, I mean, my large experience with ESPN always starts with a little, hey, not sure this is uh, the fair deal that one would think. (laughs) And they're like, yeah, but we're putting you on ESPN. And at a point, you're like, yeah, you were right. And then eventually I could, like, parlay that into for real something. The thing is, I was doing that when I was, like, 28, 29, 42. (laughs) <laughs> a slightly different That's attitude right. about these matters. Exactly. It's like you know what? I'm not paying my dues anymore. I want my money. Yeah, I already, I already got a nice watch. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, like, like this is it. it doesn't yeah. go the same. But now that's the the thing about the TV game that people don't realize is who does and doesn't get paid for what. Like, if you're not in it, and you need to realize a lot of the pay for doing TV is from being on television. That being said, while I say all that, last time I went up there to do CNN, you know who did the block right after me? Bob Costas. Costas. <laughs> Which thereby makes it very difficult for you to ever complain about, hey, I did you not pay a man about my statue. <laughs> yeah, then, yeah, I assume, then like, there's that. I've never gotten paid for any CNN, MSNBC, any of that. I assume you, you, you most people don't, except no. if you have some sort of consulting. Every now and then, you yeah. will run into a producer who offers you money. I got paid oh. twice. Okay. And never got paid again. Yeah, <laughs> I've never, I've never gotten paid. The only time you start like thinking about that is when you're like, I'm on here all the time. All the time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, once I become a piece of, you know, part of the the fabric of the thing, <laughs> that that's when it goes a little different. Like that was when uh, Dominique started doing my podcast every week. That was my big thing. It was like, so are we gonna pay him? Because like, it's one thing when you're just like, hey, can you hop on and do me a favor? It's another thing when it becomes an obligation. So we'll see you next Friday. And then the Friday mm-hmm. after that, and then the Friday after that. And by the way, we're going to no turn it into a whole franchise. We're going to give it in a literal. We're going to use your name and sell it. everything. Exactly. Exactly. Speaking of speaking of buying and selling, today's show is all about ownership. Uh before we go, of course, we're going to go do our honorary captains for Metal Arcus 77. Um, Kate Fagan does not play this game, Bomani, but I do. And my 77s off the top of my head. Dallas Cowboys defensive lineman Jim Jeffcoat from back in the day, one of the 77s. Uh, of course, being a Boston guy, you got to go Ray Bork. Yeah, 77. I was about to say. I thought I, I figured that would be your first choice. Would it be. was going to be first. And then the fact that I went Jeffcoat first just shows my age, first 77. <laughs> um, you got to go Washington Capitals forward TJ Oshi at 77. And of Ooh. course, as, because Amin will get very upset that we're doing the NBA last, but I still say if you're going to go high numbers, NBA has to come last, unless we're talking George Mikan, you got to go Luka Doncic. Right. Uh, any 77s? Cor- rest in peace to Corey Stranger of the Minnesota Vikings. Oh, I believe he was a 77. The the problem that we have with this year game, 77 is specifically a number that don't nobody really want. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you did for the 60s. Offensive oh, line. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I did nothing, if, but. but they don't want to do that. Like, they yeah. don't even want to wear the 60s, especially in the prime numbers. Like, if yeah. you get number 61, what they're basically telling you is, we don't think you're going to be here very long. <laughs> Unless you're Nate Newton and you're going to the Hall of Fame. Well, that's when they say, this is the biggest one we got. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> if we are following the news and we are following the news, Last week, the Oakland Athletics, the beleaguered Oakland Athletics, the we've been trying to move ever since we got here, Oakland Athletics, announced that they 
were buying a plot of land in Las Vegas, not far from where the Raiders play in their latest move to get out of Oakland. Been in Oakland since 1968 and been trying to leave pretty much since about 1985, 86, early 90s, trying to find their way out of here. Also, the Washington Commanders announced they had a deal in place to sell to Josh Harris, owner of the 76ers, for about six and a half billion dollars. And then, of course, that deal seems to be up in the air right now because there seems to be like a mystery buyer who's also trying to get involved in this. Um, All of these things are happening at once. And the one thing that has jumped out back and forth, I I went back to Clay Bennett, um, who took his Seattle Supersonics and just surreptitiously moved them to Oklahoma City. And it's just made me made me think over and over again about what responsibility does ownership have to an actual city, to the city where you've been playing. The A's and the city of Oakland have been fighting for about 30 years. The A's don't want to pay for a stadium. They want public money for a stadium. And they also want it both ways. They want public money for a stadium, but they also want the right to just pick up their team and leave. Bo, you've seen this for however many years. We've all been watching all of this. When you see these cities battling, you know, municipalities battling with teams, what's the responsibility that the team has to the city when they want taxpayer dollars? You know, so there's so many levels to this, right? Now, I grew up in Houston, and we moved to Houston in 87, so I was just about to turn seven years old. And one of the first things that I do remember happening in sports is – Bud Adams getting them to tear down the iconic center field scoreboard in the Astrodome so that they could build more seats, right? Now, the Astrodome, of course, is an interesting structure because it was absolutely at the height of technology when it was built simply because it existed, but you were playing sports in a warehouse. There's just, there, there there's no, <laughs> that's the one of the more charmless establishments that there has ever been. Never went. Never did. Interesting. Never did. Nah, but they tore down the scoreboard, and the scoreboard was a big deal. Like, like, like for 80 scoreboards, it was really big, and it did all kinds of graphics. Like, the, the locals were very upset about tearing down the scoreboard, but they did it. Then, when the team was terrible, he walks in after he has previously tried to move the team to Jacksonville and says, hey, we're going to move to Nashville. And legendarily, they had to save the Oilers rally that 60 people showed up to. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Go. Go. We don't care. We've done this once. We're not going to do it. Like, I don't remember anybody weeping. I don't remember any tears. I remember just a deuce chucking and you could go. And I think they reasonably assumed that they would later get another team, which is to say, I grew up around a place that will tell you to take your team and shove it. Right. Which that's, which that's, is exactly what the mayor of Oakland is doing now to the Oakland A's saying, hey, you know what? Y'all been playing us for how long? If you want to go, go. We're not going to stop you. We can blame Kate Fagan for all of this if we want. Um, being being a New Yorker, just being a New Yorker, you know, being the New Yorker that you are, let's just say that all of this and all this wrangling comes back to the same thing. The Dodgers leave in Brooklyn and the the (laughs) muscle that gets played into this, the the emotional uh, leverage that the teams always have is, do you want to be the politician who let the Dodgers leave? And go ahead, Kate. It's it's funny. when you even bring that up because I was thinking, oh, Bo, you know, Bo's talking about Houston. I'm like, oh, you know, I didn't have to deal with that in New York. Like, this wasn't a conversation. Obviously, You're a legacy I, you know, child on this. Yeah, like, I am, but I'm, I'm thinking, right, like, 80s, 90s. This was not a conversation I ever had to even entertain when it came to the, my sports fandom. Like, these things were just so deeply ingrained that it wasn't, you'd see it happen elsewhere, but you weren't really intimately involved in understanding uh, the the whys and the hows and the levers being pulled, but like the one thing, the, the phrase I I always think about when I when I think about what ownership, what what they owe the fan base or how ownership works in sports these days is like that precedent we've all heard at one time and another in our career, which is uh, sorry that phrase we've all heard one time or another in our career, just like setting a precedent, right? Like you want something in your contract, but somebody's like we don't want to set that precedent. Because God forbid the next person come, comes along and they ask for the same thing and not just the same thing, but a little bit more. And that's how I always think about these ownership games now is you probably know the history of this, Howard, but like who was the first owner uh, to say, I want your tax dollars for my stadium, right? Like, or I want this. 
I don't want to pay for that. I want this to be publicly funded. And the city being like, well, actually, we love this team. It's just a little step in that direction. Let's give it. And now what you're starting to now you're not, maybe not coming full circle, but now your generations pass the first few times that ha- that happens. And you're seeing what you, you see in Oakland, which is like, we're, we're fucking done with this. Like we, we have given and given and given as a city and you can't keep taking and taking and, and taking. And that's not always true, but that seems to be a lot of positions that cities are now, now that we most sports fans like have read the articles over the last 10 years and like your eyes have been open to the rental car tax that you are paying at the airport, which is Arizona. funding the stadium. And it, it's kind of like, well, no, like it, it, this isn't a two way street anymore. Like this isn't, you, you don't, you don't care about us beyond just extracting as many tax dollars as possible. But I'm, I mean, Howard, do you know the history of like the first, I hate to put you on the spot, but every time I do this, you usually know the history. <laughs> yeah, usually you're looking at the, the the first one was 1952, 51, 52, where Lou Perini, the owner of the Boston Braves, was like, they were playing in Boston University. They were playing over at Braves Field, which is now on the campus of BU. And they're like, look, Fenway Park is a better facility than what we got. Can you do better than what we've got? And the answer was sort of, Mm, we've got the Red Sox, we'll get back to you. And then the other thing is, is that what really, really changed was, you have to remember going back there, no team had moved in baseball ever. The, you know, they'd all stayed the same from pretty much, you know, obviously you had the Baltimore Orioles moving to New York and becoming the Highlanders, which who became the Yankees. But for the most part, you know, once you established the American and the National League in 1901, nobody went anywhere. So this is the first. So instead of the teams really muscling the cities that they were in, you had cities who wanted expansion making sweetheart deals, saying, come here, come here, come here. So there, the shoe was sort of on the other foot. You were being wooed constantly. And of course, Milwaukee wanted a team and the Milwaukee Braves, you know, Boston left in 52 and they moved to the Milwaukee, you know, become the Milwaukee Braves in 53. The big one, obviously, was was the Dodgers. It was Walter O'Malley and Robert Moses, tooth and nail. Moses was thinking about a domed stadium in Brooklyn. Can you imagine the Dodgers playing in a dome over by where, the, where Barclays is right now? I mean, this these things were all in play, but nothing was going to be able to compete with Los Angeles. So when it came to public money, private stadiums, once, once L.A. hit, then it became... It, the city's responsibility now to give us something sweet. And it's been that way ever since. You see, L.A., there's a plausible argument for using public funds for getting the Dodgers there when they did, because the history of Los Angeles was so much about adding these pieces that gave mm-hmm. cultural texture to the place. Like, at every point, they looked up and were like, hey, we don't have any artists. We need yeah. to bring in some artists. And then you bring That's in right. some artists. It's like, hey, our academic situation is not so great. I guess we need to build this up, right? Like at every turn, they well, built- because it was a desert. You had to right. build it, mm-hmm. right? But you know, this is they built it in component parts, and there's a legitimacy that came from having a baseball team. And so, California, I guess when we start, I guess um, what was Pac Bell Park? I can't remember which company they got their name on it now. I guess it's AT and T. That was the first one that went back in the other direction, as I recall, it as being entirely privately Build it funded. Yourself. And we've mm-hmm. seen that happen in California. So far, it was privately funded. Um, I think when they built the Staples Center, that that was privately funded. Like that whole state pushed back on the idea. But Oakland, as we have seen, losing all these teams in your perception as a city changes, whether or not you have even just one team, the greatest That's example, right. the Portland Trailblazers are the only reason I know anything about Portland, anything at all. All that weed would be up there and I'd have no idea about (laughs) it if they had not had the Portland Trailblazers to begin with, right? And so Oakland had seen those teams go. They saw the Warriors go across the bay. They saw the Raiders go there. And I felt like the thing was, okay, well, we can extort and get this done. And I'm like, no, you weren't ever going to be able to because you were playing in that shithole for so long. If they were ever really going to be in a position to give you money to get out of there, that would have been done a long time ago, you know? And so- I always feel like the obligation to the original question that the teams have or that you have to the city, because I do feel like teams in large part of public trust. And then if you wind up taking that money to build these stadiums, which you normally don't need, and all the economists will tell you that all these stories about how you build the stadium and suddenly you get the economic growth, unless something has changed in the last 15 years since I was really looking at that research, 
it hasn't really happened. But now they got a new game they play in to get the public money. You, know, you see what's happening in Nashville where they're building the dome because the NFL, this is maybe the most dastardly thing they ever did. They had that damn cold weather Super Bowl up there in New York. And then they had that Super Bowl in Indianapolis. And suddenly, if you built a new stadium, you got a Super Bowl. Super Bowl. And that mm-hmm. arena that you can, I mean, that stadium that you can have that Super Bowl in, you can also have Final Fours in. Now you're selling something different. Like, it's one thing if you're just asking people to build a baseball stadium in Oakland, but that's not going to attract any other events. That's not going to attract people to your city. Nashville, which is trying to become like Las Vegas East without the casinos to a degree. Look at the Red Party Central. Right. And so they want these Final Fours. They'll now be able to get a Super Bowl. They'll now be able to sell this city. Now, boom, you can make the argument that we are doing something for the greater good that I don't necessarily agree with. But to me, that also means well, y'all really can't go nowhere. Like, that would be my thought. And I feel like now, though, the only thing that's really going to bind people and keep them is the fact that they're out of places to go. Well, and that's the other point, right? <clears throat> in baseball especially, and this goes back to the 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 economics of it, uh, football, plenty of places to go for the most part. Why? Because you've got 60-40 revenue sharing. I have, I have posited that the most amazing thing in the history of sports business is that excuse me, is that you had two of the biggest four cities in the country, Los Angeles and Houston, lose their football teams. And those two teams met in the Super Bowl less than a decade later. Was it six years later? They met in the 2000 Super Bowl. That could never, ever, ever happen in baseball because in baseball, your revenue has to be generated locally. There's no, you know, revenue sharing in baseball is so low that you got to live in a city that can accommodate 81 home games. You got to build your money from your local market. And there really aren't that there's it, this isn't 1950 where Lou Perini is looking for a place to go and there are no baseball teams west of St. Louis. There's nowhere to go anymore. So now you're recycling. Now you're like, well, we were in Montreal, maybe we can go back to Montreal and make that work or you know, maybe there's a way to Hey, Columbus, Ohio is pretty big, and maybe Salt yeah. Lake City trying Salt to get Lake a baseball City trying today. to get in the game, and so, so now you've got a totally different dynamic. But one thing I want to throw out here as well is the value of a world class. What makes a world class city? When early on you had to have first run movies, you had to have an opera, you had to have a ballet, you had to have those things that made you a first class city, and then. Getting to the you know, second half of the 20th century, you had to have sports team. You had to have multiple sports teams. And this is what puts you on the map. And that adds even more pressure, Kate, to the municipality who wants to get tough with the, you know, with the Baltimore Colts. And they'll be like, you know, maybe under the cover of night, we'll pack our shit and move to Indianapolis, right? Do these cities even have the leverage anymore to to fight this fight because the expectation is if you're if you're about it you need a pro team i mean look at the san antonio spurs they play in a place you know, they're doing home games now they did two home games in austin austin doesn't have any pro teams but once again if you want to be big you got to show yeah i mean i i have a i have a different kind of reference point from that since i live in charleston south carolina and part of the conversation that is consistently happening around here to, to bo's mention of nashville is like we have to actively not become Nashville because 30 years ago, there was probably a lot of comparisons between Charleston and Nashville. And I'm not saying Charleston would never, like if it grew and grew and grew, would never like all of a sudden uh, have their minds spun to the idea of bringing in a, a huge, a, a big major league team. But all of the conversation when you live in a small city, and I don't know what it was like generations ago is that is not necessarily anymore what you need to be considered a world-class city. Like, you know, and this is a very local point of view, but there's a different metric now when it comes to like, that. you'll always look at lists of like the best places to visit or coolest little cities in, in the world. And Charleston is always on them. And I think there has been a disillusionment with what it means and what the cost is to have a major professional sport that didn't, and I think the equation was very different 
a isn't generation similar, ago. Isn't that similar, Kate, to the Olympics? That there used to be an allure to getting the Olympics, and now it's like, yes. I don't know if this is really worth it anymore. Well, and to well, your point about like the community aspect and whether or not these major organizations, what their community responsibility is, like in these smaller cities, like the one I live in, like we have a lot of sports, but they are all very much community oriented. Like there's a USL team. You know, there's like there's these different places like that where the value the city extracts from them is more in line with with what the city is. And when I look at the major professional teams, it seems like there's been a degradation of like what their actual community involvement is. Like you know, maybe 50 years ago, the pro players were closer to community members in terms of salaries and identification and like and where they were going within the city than they were to the owners. And there's certainly a separation now in terms of like the community attachment that like big time male professional athletes have because they are no longer necessarily like in line with what the fan base or what the community salary wise and all of that. Like they're in a completely different stratosphere in this generation. Yeah, yeah I mean, th that San Antonio Austin one is going to be very interesting though, because San Antonio is a weird one where it's top ten in population but very low in metro area because it sprawls. And then I'd it's be so curious big. to know, um, given how uh, overwhelm not overwhelmingly, but it's a lot of Spanish speaking going on in San Antonio. I don't know how much of the population is monolingual to Spanish, but then that has an effect on how you're selling these American sports. But Austin, which um, you know, you mentioned Kate talking about how Charleston doesn't want to be Nashville. Austin hashtag keep Austin weird. Mm. Now it's a different kind of weird um that they have going there, but that's a town that's attracting people that'll want a basketball team. They'll want an arena yeah. to sit courtside with. And that is the sort of place that I could absolutely see believing that having an NBA franchise would legitimize it in a way. And I think that if there was the Austin, whatever it was the way Austin rings out in people's minds would be different. Cause like, I think that people, when you say like the keep Austin weird stuff and everything else, I think in their minds, if you don't know any better, you think of Austin similar to what Portland is. And it's like, yeah, if you put Austin in the dryer and let it shrink down a bit, <laughs> then it would wind up being Portland. They get a basketball team and then it looks different. But with San Antonio, that's the team. That's where the roots are. But that is like, I don't, I don't think of Austin and San Antonio as the same, but it's kind of like Orlando, Tampa, where for purposes of this discussion, they wind up being the market. If the Spurs leave San Antonio, they're leaving town, but they're not really leaving, but they're leaving just enough to where if you're in San Antonio, you're salty about it. Well, we'll, we'll come back to that um, yeah. because I do, I have, do have a point I want to make on that, but you know, also want to switch gears in, an, in another spot as well, which is, when you're thinking about these teams, Kate, we spend so much time talking about players. We spend so much time talking about who's putting out, who's not putting out, you know, who's giving effort, who should be traded, all of this. I mean, obviously the players are the game, so that's sort of a piece of it. But in the money ball era, and as things become more and more and more empire-based, and as we're talking about franchise valuations, Daniel Snyder is about to make a boatload of money from selling the Washington Commanders. That football team, that that business, not even the football team, but that company that is the Washington football team is mired in scandal right now. They're, they've got government investigations. They've got lawsuits by former employees. And Daniel Snyder is going to still come out of this, maybe reputationally not great, but he didn't have a great reputation anyway. He's going to come out on top with a huge sale. And that team has been garbage. They never, they didn't make an NFC championship game. They certainly, obviously they've never made the Super Bowl. Clearly they didn't win the Super Bowl. They, they have been so bad. And yet we seem to, why do we slough off the responsibility on owners? Is it simply because we are so enamored with money that we figure that if you own the team, you can do whatever you want with it, or simply because you feel powerless because the, you can't do anything with the owner anyway. You can trade players, but you can't right. trade owners. Why, why do they get the free pass? Yeah, I mean, it, sometimes it seems like it comes down to like really basic things. Like it's sexy to have a conversation about whether Dame, Limmer, Dame Lillard, you know, wants to win or doesn't want to win. A, a conversation we've had here on, on Metal Larkers. And the, you watch sports, you can actually intellectually engage in that conversation because whether you know a little bit or a lot about basketball, 
that's something that you, you can just have anywhere with anyone a conversation about. I don't think there's a there's not a lot of folks who want to engage in a in an ownership business conversation. <laughs> we don't want to talk about Daniel Snyder. To, which is much to the benefit of somebody like like a Daniel, like a Snyder or any other owner we can name is like it's not a sexy conversation to have. And so it, we just end up we we can end up relating so much more to the players and like it, 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 you and I offline, how we're talking about this topic and, and the, these storylines and like, this ownership like Washington and Daniel Snyder making billions of dollars, despite being arguably the most flawed franchise in our, in our professional franchises here in the U S like that to me, it's an indication of a completely broken sports model. Like, well, look it, at look at um, Don, Donald Sterling. I mean, for everything we said about Donald Sterling, he cleared two billion. Yeah, yeah. But, but like Sterling didn't have an audience, though. He didn't have a fan base. There was nobody to actually be mad at him. If Dan <laughs> Snyder was in France, they'd have ran his ass out of there so long ago. Like they would have been out there with picket signs and everything else. Those Europeans, they got a whole different attitude about their teams. Well, like, they, they believe the team belongs to them. It's yes, theirs. Yep. Yes, they do. And. Americans believe it too until the rich people tell them that they don't. And they're like, yeah, you're right. Because this <laughs> this society, the value of property rights in this society is so high. And that's just something that we just don't talk about. The idea that this is mine. And that's where we get into it with these sports teams is, is it yours, right? Given the investment that you ask from, not just from the government, but just from the people themselves. Is this really yours for you to just pick up and leave? Like the unspoken part, or the forgotten part about the Colts moving to Indianapolis is why they moved in the cover of darkness. Cause the state was coming the next day to claim That's the right. team via eminent domain. Mm -hmm. Like Ursay's thing was it's my team. And the city was like, no, it's our team. And he snuck out before there could be a real resolution to it. Mm -hmm. Two things I want to throw out here as we, as we keep going one before, um, you know, Bo to go to your other point, the, <clears throat> One of the battles, I was in Austin a few weeks ago, and one of the battles taking place there because Tesla's down there now and because Austin is growing, you know, it's growing like Vegas was growing, you know, 20 years ago and um, 25 years ago. And the argument is, is that either, you know, in either direction, either San Antonio is trying to incorporate Austin as part of the metro area or Austin is incorporating San Antonio as part of their metro area. <laughs> And and so you're right. There's going to be this this competition for who owns that area, and and what does that mean? I've always thought about San Antonio sort of as an afterthought, simply because you know you think when you think Texas, you're thinking the capital, you're thinking Dallas, you're thinking Houston. San Antonio is a huge city, but it doesn't have the concentration that you know, some of the other cities have. The other thing I was going to bring up here too was Austin is also in line for ne like Nashville in terms of when you're thinking about what is it that brings people here. And one of the things that people were talking about when I was down there was they're becoming bachelorette party city as well. Like how do we draw people here? And so it's like the mini New Orleans is and the mini Vegas is. If you don't, you know, if you're not going to be New York and you're not going to be Philly, you you become party cities. You know, Phoenix was doing that for a long time. And now Nashville and now Austin, these are the joints you go to when you want to have a wild weekend, right? And so revenue generation. The other thing I wanted to bring up is to, to uh, something Kate and I were talking about earlier, Bo, and Kate jump in on this, is we've reached a point now in male professional sports. Well, hold on. Hold on, with, hold on. Let me catch one thing before you yep. go there that I think is important also with Austin and San Antonio. Mm -hmm. They are the remaining leverage for teams that want to extort their local municipalities. Los Angeles was hey, Give that. me your list. Yeah. Right. Well, lo, like, it, I mean, Las Vegas now, they've, you know, they, they, they've got all the teams now. Like, they can't really exist. I really think San Antonio always exists because something that is lost is that the state of Louisiana has to pump I believe hundreds of millions of dollars into the Saints, you know, because New Orleans is simply not a viable major league city by population or anything else yeah. anymore. Tom Benson, who I guess he's now died, but the owner of the team, his widow now owns the team, was a San Antonio guy. And they built the Alamo Dome in the 90s for the we can get an NFL team. The NFL team never got there, never mm -hmm. showed up. 
but they always had that building. It's kind of like that shithole they got in Tampa. That was part of that. Like it was all for baseball. It was the leverage the Giants obviously used. Like, hey, we could always go over there. That's right. Austin in San Antonio, or Austin's going to serve as that place also because we still got a lot of places that got teams but barely got a dot on the map. And as long as you've got one of those rising places that can serve as that leverage, you're going to wind up having that game. Now, with Austin, it'll be interesting because they have a pro football team. They wear orange. They don't That's really right. need That would be the UT. Team. Right. Mm-hmm. But they'll take a back. I mean, even though they just built the new arena for the, for, um, for the Longhorn basketball team, I think that they would, in a heartbeat, build themselves an NBA arena and allow somebody else to use them as the, you know, oh, you know we could always go to Austin because I here. just don't know what's left. San, I mean, NBA already got so much bad real estate, I can't think of what's left. No, you got Portland, small market, but the Mariners would be like, hell no, that's too close to us. You've got Charlotte where, you know, you've got two teams in Charlotte, but, um, you know, can you really put another sports team in Charlotte? Right. Right. You've got Nashville for baseball. You've got Salt Lake City, which is bizarre, um, but once again, somewhat viable you can go back to the future you can go back to montreal if you want baseball um but seriously there's just not a lot of spots that are clamoring the one that has always fascinated me that faye vincent back when he was commissioner used to talk about all the time in baseball was go back to the future in new york and put a third team in connecticut you know put a team there's a lot of people there and I, you know, and obviously that would never happen because the Yankees would have a fit, the Mets would have a fit, and the Red Sox would have a fit. You can put a team, another team in New England, you know. So you're running out of space. The other piece of this too is that as we go further and further into the the male professional sports, we've reached saturation. Yep. And we haven't done that in the women's sports game. And now, as we've seen with the Final Four in basketball this year, as we've seen with the WNBA, that the women's game is essentially maybe the equivalent of professional male sports back in the 50s and the early 60s, where there's a a blank canvas. It can sort of be what you make it. What is that looking like in the women's game, Kate? Well, yeah, when we were talking offline about this topic, one of the things that came to mind for me is just the amount of times I've heard the phrase over the last couple of weeks that men's sports have a broken model and they're trying to fix it. And I don't even know, like, that's a premise I'm not sure the two of you necessarily agree with. Some of the idea that it's a broken model is like, how do we end up with a majority of our professional sports teams are not even trying to win, right? Like, or the ownership model has just, is just such a, such a a gathering of wealth at the top versus you see these new women's franchises models being almost like a a co-op where you have dozens and dozens of owners who have community ties and it's much more being like a community built model. So I like yesterday I was at the Business of Women's Sports Summit. Two people said, like who have studied the data on this, that men's sports model is broken. And for all for the reasons we are, are have kind of mentioned here, whereas like there's a lot of white space in women's sports. Like there are models that haven't even ever been built, have just been completely uh, ignored for generations, whether it's merchandising, bedding, certainly stadium building. I mean, Kansas City which has an NWSL team is building the first ever stadium that will be specifically and only for now a stadium built for a women's sports team, right? Like that has never happened in history. So uh, first of all, just the premise, right? Cause if all, if all of our conversation now is like the, the community, the broken uh, connection between community and ownership for various reasons and the ownership extracting so much wealth from franchises that may, have never even won, does that indicate to you that there is a broken model in, in men's sports? Well, yeah, I mean, I think we forget that the people who own these sports teams weren't always this rich. 
right? There wasn't right. always this kind of money. Like, I think a great analog to what's happening is what happens when the music industry goes corporate. Like, it was a much better situation when the people, who, you, to own a record company, you had to really enjoy what this thing is that you're doing. And that really isn't the case anymore, right? And so, yes, this is, I think it's absurd to buy, like, like buying a Corvette to save gas. Like, you're buying a team to make money like, I would think that you bought the team because you already had all this money and now it's just time for you to floss. Like, this is a boat. This is what this is. No, these are profit centers for these guys because the TV money is so big and always seems to expand. And as much as we talk about TV going to the wayside, no, nah, not really, right? At least no. not in a way where it can't be monetized. And I do think that like baseball, for example, specifically has a model that is broken. I would not necessarily make the argument about football. I think basketball got them, the NBA got itself into a trick bag on that one but i think they've slowly like inched themselves out what worries me though about the idea if the model of men's sports is broken what we've seen in the wnba for example though joe size bought a team uh kelly leffler sold it to one of those collectives but this is you know married to the uh the man who ran the new york stock exchange right like i know she had not to say she didn't have her own money i'm just saying that to say that whole class of people seems to be coming in because they think there's money to be made off of it like they think that there's a party there what I want to know specifically with the WNBA is when will they be able to expand? Because the broken part of the model that especially with the WNBA has is all these players, eight teams or 12 oh. or whatever the exact number is. Yeah. Like we are at the glut because of talent where first round picks can't make a roster because the salaries like, can't go <clears throat> up high enough to age the old people out. NBA 1962. I would like to tell you a story because Bo brought up the music industry. And as we're talking about where we where we are right now in sports, when I was four years old, four years old, yeah, um, my favorite album was Stevie Wonder's Inner Visions. I used to sing it all the time as a little kid. My parents, my mother, took me and my sister to the local record store in Boston, Skippy White's in Mattapan, and she told us that we, we could both choose an album. And I chose Inner Visions and my mother wouldn't let me buy it. And the reason she wouldn't buy it for me was because she said, we already have it. And I said, yeah, but I don't have my own personal copy. So I ended up leaving with Winnie the Pooh. And my <laughs> sister ended up with um, Alice in Wonderland. Fast forward to 2016, I think, there was an anniversary. It was like the 44th or 43rd anniversary of, of Intervisions coming out. 43rd. And and um, I love that album so much. And I love the cover art and the whole thing. And so I decided to go do a little internet dive on the cover art. And the guy who did the cover art is still alive. I called him, a man named Ephraim Wolf. I call, I emailed him and asked him, you know, if he could make me a print of the, of the cover album of the, uh, of the inside art. And I bought a print from him and it's hanging up in my room. And I also asked him, could you tell me a little bit about this? And he tells me this great story about how he was a college student, like a sophomore, you know, his dad was a musician and he was looking for like a summer gig and he was an artist and he just walked into Tamla and asked for a gig, you know, got anything I can do here? And they told him, well, yeah, well, you know, we're looking for some cover art for a couple of our uh, upcoming albums. Um, we've got a Stevie Wonder. Um, maybe you want to do some art for it. And the album's going to be called Talk and Book. And, um, you know, we'd like you to do the cover art for it. And then the, the higher up, one of the higher ups said, well, Talking Book we think is going to be a really big hit and you're really young. So why don't you do this one? Inner Visions is another album he's got. Why don't you do the cover art for that? He walked in off of the street. And in terms of the big business, the way business becomes what it is today, this would never, ever, ever happen anymore. So when you're looking at, you know, the, the size of professional sports on the male side, and then you look at where we are, like the blank canvas, there may still be some sort of crazy entrepreneurial stories on the women's model right now, because there is so much white space. There are, you know, sort of stories for, you know, the creativity of it to still come through, whereas on the male side, it's just too big. Yeah. 
And, and to that point, I love that story as well. To, to that point, and then also kind of what Bo alluded to with like, who's coming in, the billionaires who are buying some of the women's franchises. Like the big question mark is what, and we've talked about this on this pod, Howard, like, do we want women's sports to look like men's sports? Right. Like, <laughs> is that what we want? Because it ain't that pretty, right? I mean, there's a lot about it that's great if you're talking about you can make a hundred million dollars if you are the very best of the best. So of course I want bigger salaries for women, but like, do I like the lack of community engagement? Do I like the fact that youth sports is just a complete mess? Do I, like all of these things that have been driven by the way men's sports is is driven? Like that's not the vision I have for women's sports. So when you know people always say this thing all the time, like you know what, in a couple of years, I don't want it to be women's sports. I want it to just be sports. And I'm like, I don't. <laughs> sports ain't that great. <laughs> yeah. Maybe women's sports can be great to your point of like, is there a way? Is there a way to build, you know, build a world where like you still have connection to the community? You are giving back. You do have like stories like the one you just told, but that's not going to be the future of women's sports if it's simply a pursuit for driving up franchise valuations as high as you can possibly get them by having bazillionaires come in and run the future of women's sports like it has to look differently if you want it to be something different you have to have a different model but like i don't know that we have the imagination to imagine something yeah different. hey Bo, no, like, you like, oh, kind of kind of what's great about women's sports as it exists now is that there's not that much money in it on the back end because something that i don't think is talked about enough because this sprawling monster of youth sports and what it's turned into and it just amazes me a, how many people think is that important that like your kids be good at something? Like people really, really, really just want to be good at something for the sake of being good at something. But I'm just blown away how many people are giving all day weekends and buying these SUVs and driving all around. And, Thank you, Earl Woods. Right. <laughs> but if you're in the 1960s, like call it basketball, that was a stupid play. There were only eight teams. Like the math did not justify going all in on ball in this way. Now the money, I mean, obviously the money wasn't as much either, but now the money is a lot more. But the difference between eight teams and 30 teams in a nation of 300 people is not <laughs> that high. There are 450 jobs in the NBA, and all these people think they're going to get them because the potential payoff of the 100 200 $300 million contract or whatever it is creates enough of an incentive to do that. And But to do it, it has to be such tunnel vision because it's the competition – is so strong, right? And so what we wind up with, A, the least interesting group of basketball players that we've ever had. Like, that, that is the saddest part because they're pros when they're young because they have to comport themselves yep. as pros when they're young yep. to get to that point. You go look at women's ball. It's so much more interesting. The people are so much more interesting. The energy around it is so much healthier. It's almost like people are in it for the game itself. I was going to say it's, it's not, a sport. It's a right, game. Yeah. It's yeah, almost the like they're actually people. Who yes. are, have full rounded lives. Yes. yes. Like the, the externalities of the game and the money that comes from it is so like problematic. But the way that we the way that we glean respect in this society is via money, right? Like I think a big part of why we have the discussions that we have about salaries in the WNBA and everything else is in part because we want these women to be paid like this, because the people who get paid like this get treated like this. And it's not just Part of it is the pay equity, obviously, but also was the idea of respect and these women deserve the same respect that their male peers get. But it's hard to get that if there's not if money. Have the money. Mm -hmm. But then if we get the money, man, we're going to wind up with people that we don't want to respect nearly as much as we do right now. Not that you should take a vow of poverty necessarily, but it's to the case original point. Do we really want this to be like this other madness? Well, and we also let's about? go and also let's, let's go move quickly into into one other thing, uh, Bo, is that. The buy-in is enormous. If you want to be a major league baseball owner, you have to be 30% liquid of the sale price. Not net worth, liquid. So if you want to buy the New York Yankees, which are valued at $7.5 billion, you've got to have $2.25 billion sitting in your <laughs> savings account. Right now. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> so like, so what does that mean? So like, um, unless the Saudis are going to buy the Yankees, there's like, what, nine people in the United States who can buy the, the New York Yankees? If you want to buy a professional basketball team, you've got to be 15% liquid. 
You know, I mean, you gotta have the cash well, on. And the hand. Milwaukee Bucks just went for four billion dollars, and so did the Suns. But at least the Suns are in Phoenix. The <laughs> Milwaukee Bucks just went for four billion dollars. Yep. But if I wanted to become a, a small owner in an NWSL team or a WNBA team, maybe the buy-in's twenty-five thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars to have like a fraction of a fraction, but because they want the community of it. Like, I, I doubt that there are ownership groups looking for the NFL or NBA who are like, well, what value does that person add beyond money? Whereas on the women's side, you're like, well, do they add value in me? Do they add value in X, Y, and Z? So like, I mean, ultimately it's, it's back to the original thing we we're talking about five, 10 minutes ago, which is like, I like that model better. Like, does that model, like, do I like shopping at co-ops? Yeah, I do. But I don't know how you maintain that ultimately. But it also goes back to Bomani's point about, about interesting people. You have cut the number of people who can join this thing. Right. Right? I mean, how many people, when you're looking at these franchise valuations, have the liquidity to even get into the game? Like when I'm I can't wait to see what happens if Josh Harris gets the commanders when Magic Johnson moves in on this. Is so did he parlay his two percent interest in the dodges to a two percent two percent interest in the commanders or is he playing at a higher level now i mean the number of people and it goes back to something Bo, you and i've talked about for years when you know from a racial standpoint or a labor standpoint when you have the athletes going man we've got to do our own leagues we got to have our own teams do you know how much this is going to cost you can't do it now, George Steinbrenner bought the New York Yankees for $10 million in 1973. They're worth $7.5 billion now. Right. Uh, Jer Jerry Jones could not buy his way into the NFL at this point. I mean, the, the, the gap is huge. So where does that leave you? Where does that leave you it, with those valuations to bring our conversation full circle as we wrap it up? One, at that level of financial commitment, there's no way these teams are going to, unless there's some level of force that I can't consider right now, that's going to say, okay, if you want to move, you got to sell locally first. They're going to be like, nope, my team, my money, I can do whatever I want with it. Two, you're going to have a very small number of people who are able to get involved in this in the first place. To Kate's point about, well, if that's the case, then clearly this is there's something of it that is broken. You also have some level of uh, brokenness if four or five teams a year are the only ones who are competing to win. Right. So when you're when you're looking at this to wrap up, Bo, where's the avenue where you see? I don't want to say hope, but I say where you see the most movement. Where you say, okay, this five ten years from now is going to look different here. Is there any way? that we could get more drug dealers involved. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I asked that because I was thinking about uh, the two Escobars, the 30 for 30 they did on Pablo Escobar that was really centered around the soccer, right? That the Doe Boys in Colombia in the 80s were funding the soccer teams. And you know why? Because they enjoyed soccer, right? They wanted their soccer teams to be the best. That might not work out so well for the referees every now and then, <laughs> but they really cared about winning. winning. They really cared about flossing. These dudes care about making money off of these teams. Like, where is the mm -hmm. thing about Steinbrenner that was so interesting is that he really wanted his baseball team to be good. Like, he figured out if I'm going to be somebody here, I mean, he's a shipbuilder from Cleveland, but if I'm going to be somebody in this city, this baseball team going to need to hit. And if they do, then I get the spoils. This billionaire class traffics in a different way at this point. And I would think that if you wanted to buy a team, it's because you wanted to have a good team and you wanted to be the guy like Cohen is doing. We did something on Game yeah. Theory about this, like Cohen is doing. But there's only like two or three of those people who actually have that sort of like inclination and motivation. Even Jerry Jones, where you could question how much he wants to win. You can't say he ain't trying and he does at least want his team to be interesting. And the Yankees and, are the family business now. Right. And you and I talked about this, that people have sports have been printing money for so long that nobody bothered to ask why. And the why is because this stuff is interesting. It is compelling. It, it, it draws in on human emotion in a way and is evocative in a way that keeps us around and all that is fading 
in the face of all this money and with these owners who have absolutely no accountability to where we start in the very beginning because rich people have no accountability because they are the paragons of respect at this point. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest word that we've used this entire hour is like the gap. The gap, we're, we're talking about the gap between what it used to cost to own, what it costs now, the gap between community and ownership and you know, connection to your team, the gap between players and fan bases. I mean, all of that is only growing. So I don't know, Howard, if it was like solution oriented. I mean, like Bo said, like if, if sports sells itself consistently because it's just, you know, fun, beautiful, whatever it has been over the years. And now if the money is so incredibly big that you are even uh, triple checking a tweet you send out because it can't go away, well, then that storytelling is also going to be corroded. So, I, you know, I guess I do tend to lean like all the times I've heard of the last couple of weeks, like the model is broken. That doesn't mean man, sports is broken, but if the model is broken, the after effects of that over the next decade, we will start to see where those breaks are. Uh, I don't I mean, I don't know how you how, how you close that gap, though. Because yeah, I don't think you can. You can't close it because it requires like, do I want players to make less money? Do I want the franchises to be worth less? Like. That, that gap is only growing and to, to close it is what what you need to to create the energy that sports provides that's right and it's going to be virtually impossible to do that because of the level of growth um to close i will simply say that uh looking quickly at the inflation calculator 10 million dollars in 1973 is the equivalent to 67.9 million today you might not even be able to get. Yeah, you can't even get season tickets for sixty-seven million dollars now. <laughs> Never mind the seven billion. We're in a different state. It's a different. It's 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 a whole new ball game, as 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 they say. And um, now, by the way, those super rich kids don't want to spend no money on the baseball team. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. I mean, it's just and and you know, and the thing that we didn't really talk enough about, and we can get this into uh, some other time, is. The real thing to fear is the Olympics. Like if the if you're watching this in terms of the money, the Olympics used to be the most interesting thing during an Olympic year. It was the thing that we people don't even care about it anymore. It's gone. And so to your point, Bo, about it being about sports being interesting and sports pulling at the heart and the compelling nature of it, it's also very, very clannish. So the thing you've got to hold on to is that being in New York or being in Boston or Atlanta or something has to matter. Otherwise, you get the Houston effect where it's like, well, bye. Yeah. See you the, later. Olympics, the Olympics need need another Cold War. I don't think we've had <laughs> I don't think we've had an adequate discussion about having a big old, old enemy really right. made the Olympics a lot more interesting. One hundred percent. With that, I am Howard Bryant. This is Kate Fagan as well. And Bomani Jones, we want to thank you for making your maiden voyage on Meadowlark. It's, it's good. It's, unpaid. This, is a, unpaid this is a first to be. <laughs> I'm usually on your pod. This is the, the first time I've actually tried to play point guard. No, nah, man, I appreciate you guys uh, having me on. It's been a good time. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. Next week, we got Meadowlark 78. We have no idea what it's going to be about. We don't know anything beyond that point. I don't even have a 78 for you right now, except maybe New England Patriots. Oh, my God. Tony McGee, 78. Leon Lett. Leon, Leon Lett is 78, yes. No, I just flex him. There it is. Check your record player for a 78 for the old schoolers. We'll see you next week.